the terror connection to the Iran Contra scandal. Again, for those just tuning in, um, uh, we do go about this a little different and perhaps in more depth than you're used to hearing on the regular news broadcast. Part of the reason is, of course, that most of the key players in the Iran Contra uh, affair, whatever you want to call it, are people whose names have been cropping up on One Step Beyond and our other related broadcasts for. Uh, um, some of them clear back to 1979 when we first started this whole thing. So um, we are not merely rehashing. We are, in fact, going into some depth and exploring some other people's research and uh, sharing a little bit of our own with you. So we are going to continue uh, in this part of the broadcast talking about the uh, the deep sixing of the October surprise or the, the, the purported October surprise. Uh, in fact, it may have been an October surprise. For Jimmy Carter, yeah. <laughs> a very different sort, indeed. Now, one of the things we're going to begin looking at, uh, well, by way of looking at the manipulation of the hostage crisis, we took a look at the role of Henry Kissinger, again, closely allied with the secret team through Task Force 157, and as we're also going to look at later, to, with direct connections to many of the people who have, fung who have surfaced both as players and alleged investigators in the Iran-Contra scandal. We took a look at Kissinger, Kissinger's role in uh, getting the Shah admitted to the United States, directly resulting in the, in the taking of the hostages, as was accurately forecast by the National Security Establishment. We're now going to take a look at some very ominous indications that the Desert One rescue mission, that was the military attempt to rescue the hostages in April of 1980, was deliberately sabotaged from within. Obviously, a number of American servicemen lost their lives. This would constitute treason of the highest order. And uh, we are going to take a look at uh, just such a question. We're going to start out reading extensively from a very fine article by Donald Freed that was originally published in the first issue of Rebel Magazine, uh, which magazine, its uh, rise and fall, is a story in and of itself that we're not going to get into tonight. But this is from the Rebel Magazine, uh, dated November 22nd, 1983. We, we should probably just mention that uh, Rebel was uh, a very fine and very short-lived uh, political magazine, specifically a, a magazine devoted to political inquiry, uh, possibly, although it didn't last long, for its brief tenure, which was something like eight issues, the best in, that this country has ever seen, because of that very reason, it was very short-lived. This first issue, by the way, we dealt with some sections of it in Radio Free America number 11. The cover story was Mae Russell's article on the Nazi connections to the assassination of John Kennedy. Again, we exerted that one extensively in RFA number 11. That same dynamite issue contained a fabulous article by Don Freed. Indeed. And the article it is named, or is titled, A Question of Treason, and subtitled, How Ronald Reagan Sabotaged the Iranian Hostage Rescue Mission. The Iranians Knew We Were Coming. Again, the article by Donald Freed in the first issue of The Nation, mag uh, The Rebel Magazine, excuse me, dated November 22nd, 1983. Um, Donald Freed, also, of course, uh, author of Death in Washington and a number of other things that we have used from time to time on our broadcasts. The Carter Debate Briefing Book is the tip of the wrong iceberg. Uh, Freed here, of course, is referring to Debategate, which some of you out there may have already forgotten. In the capacious Reagan dragnet, it was one small, shiny object dredged up from the murky depths of the 1980 campaign. Reagan's secret operation, run by Casey, Allen, and Clark, and that's, of course, Bill Casey, Richard Allen, and uh, William Clark, had as its target not the debate, but the Iranian hostage crisis, the, quote, October surprise. Reagan did not fear Carter's television persona in a debate. Reagan had the speech. He feared Carter's executive power to launch a daring rescue of the American hostages that he could not overcome that would re-elect Carter. That alone. In the winter of 1980, Ronald Reagan's candidacy was floundering. He had lost Iowa to George Bush. New Hampshire hung in the balance. Enter William Casey. Casey and Richard Allen huddle with Reagan's closest advisors, Ed Meese and Judge William Clark, and decide to pull out the stops. They decide to activate a mole in the Carter White House and other moles in the National Security Council, the NSC, and in the CIA. They decide to activate a spy ring inside their own government. In diplomatic terms, they put into operation a coup de main. Is this scenario credible? The network, of, of, the network of moles delivered many secrets, but none so important as news of, quote, an ac October surprise. Sensitive material from the NSC began to flow to Allen. Secret information from CIA and ex-CIA sources reached Casey. A top, quote, control or agent handler in Casey's ring was, Steve, was Stephen Halper, or Stephen Halper, a, quote, researcher from the Bush campaign. 
Halper's father, father-in-law was Dr. Ray Klein, former deputy director of the CIA and a high Reagan advisor. Now, don't mix him up with Thomas Klein. They are different people. Halper, through Klein, had far-reaching access to the most sensitive sources. Consider who Reagan's close advisor, Klein, is. Ray Klein's illustrious or notorious career in the clandestine world had led in his mature years to the directorship of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the CSIS, housed at Georgetown University, and to the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, AFIO. Uh, by the way, in passing, we should mention Donald Freed wrote a great deal about the AFIO and its leader, David Atlee Phillips, um, and there's a strong participation in the overthrow of the Allende government in Cuba. In, in Chile. In Ch- uh, thank you. <laughs> yes, the Allende government in Chile. Although the, the same team does go back to Cuba, and, and it mm-hmm. incidentally included Ray Klein, who we heard con- in, in uh, a couple of our Radio Free America shows in uh, The Great Heroine Coup. He has commented on Shackley and company, and he should know because he worked very closely with them. By the way, the, the uh, book Nip referred to, Death in Washington, we relied on considerably in our last broadcast. Now that I've confused everybody thoroughly, let me reread that last short sentence. Ray Klein's illustrious or notorious career in the clandestine world had led in his mature years to the directorship of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, housed at Georgetown University, and to the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. Thanks to the background, then, of Casey, Allen, and George Bush as former director of CIA, it is now possible to grasp the range and depth of the Reagan operation in 1980. A memo has now surfaced, directed to Meese and Casey, referring to a White House mole. This has been laughed off by Reagan and aides as the work of someone, quote, who's read too many spy novels. Elizabeth Drew, writing in The New Yorker, raises a compelling argument against such wisecracks. What? What if, she asks, there is another possibility? It was known that the Reagan campaign was obsessed with the possibility that Carter might, shortly before the election, obtain the release of the hostages held in Iran. When Casey told a breakfast meeting of reporters at the Republican convention in Detroit that the Reagan people thought there might be an October surprise, his suggestion just seemed like good politics. Any successful move by Carter would be seen as having been manipulated for the election. At the time, Casey used the term, quote, intelligence operation to describe the monitoring activity the campaign would conduct in order to anticipate the surprise. One aide told Elizabeth Drew that some of the campaign leaders saw the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962, just before that year's congressional elections, as a parallel for what Carter might do in October 1980. Quote, they knew what happened on what day in October 62, this man said, and how the congressional elections were affected. It had already been reported that one Reagan campaign aide, Admiral Robert Garrick, retired, had organized a network of retired military officers to watch military bases for the movement of troops or transport planes. Garrick confirmed this. The disclosure was at once ludicrous and worrisome. When Carter attempted the rescue mission that failed in April of 1980, the ships and helicopters were already in the area. A former Carter foreign policy official says that a vital requirement of that or any other foreign res- any other rescue mission was that it be carried out without any noticeable movement of troops or ships from the United States. He and others say that there were some contingency plans for another hostage rescue attempt, but that it was never seriously considered because, among other things, the hostages had been dispersed from the American embassy where they had been held. Continuing. Logical observers ask what the Reagan campaign could possibly have done with information of a Carter rescue mission. To reveal the plan or use the information for political gain would be treasonous. This question leads to a series of related questions. Was the CIA, for instance, loyal to Carter, as they had not been to Nixon? Old boys, unquote, had blocked Carter's appointee, Theodore Sorensen, to head the CIA. This unprecedented rejection of a notable figure such as Sorensen forced Carter in 1977 to appoint an outsider, Admiral Stansfield Turner, to the directorship of the CIA. Turner removed about 600 people from their jobs in the area of covert operations. Many of these people were placed in other positions, about 200 of them retired, and a few were fired outright. I would interrupt that among the people fired outright were Messrs. Wilson, Kleins, and Shackley of the secret team. Continuing, this makes for a very unhappy network. Some of these people were what one former Carter official calls the cowboys, the ones who run around and do things, unquote. 
Moreover, Carter, in 1978, issued a charter designed to put reins on the activities of the FBI and the CIA. Many of the former CIA people who helped out in the Bush campaign joined the Reagan-Bush campaign after the nomination. Among the people working with Klein, Halper, et al. was Robert Gambino, who had been the CIA Director of Security, a position that gave him access to the files of people who had received high-level security clearances. All of Casey's men were active in the Association of Former Intelligence Officers National Network. Ms. Drew sums up well by saying that, it is, known in the Reagan, it is known that the Reagan campaign was extremely worried that Carter might do something about the hostages. It is clear that there was, within the, there was, within the Reagan campaign, a pattern and practice of obtaining sensitive information from within the White House. Perhaps all this activity amounts to separate pebbles. Perhaps it forms a mosaic. In any event, as far as is known, this sort of activity does not represent, as some suggest, politics as usual. Of course, there have been dirty tricks before, and especially in the pre-Watergate days, some high-handed activities on the part of administrations, but that was then. As of now, there is no sign that anything quite like this has occurred before, unquote. If the Casey Allen spying had as its priority the sabotage of Carter's hostage policy, was the Carter briefing book of any importance at all? Yes. What is not generally recalled is that Carter and Reagan were even in the polls in October of 1980 when the crucially important debate was held. The debate was the climax of the campaign. Reagan had to prove that he could do more than smile and joke, that he was more than an actor. In short, Reagan had to be briefed to destroy Carter in detail. The debate was a fraud because Reagan had been stuffed with stolen information. Just as he had stolen football plays while in high school and President Johnson's message on Vietnam to the Governor's Conference in 1967, so Reagan had stolen for him the other, so Reagan had stolen for him the other side's signals in 1980. The stakes were high. The debate was the key event of the race. Richard Wirtlin, or Wirtlin, W-I-R-T-H-L-I-N, told Elizabeth Drew that, quote, given the political environment, the election is going to hang or fall on that debate, unquote. Reagan's aides confided to Time magazine that the stolen documents had included every important item Carter used on the air, unquote. David Stockman bragged in a speech that Reagan would win the debate and the election because of the filched briefing material. Casey and Allen had been sucking up information right across the federal bureaucracy. The briefing material used in the debate was one of their ancillary discoveries. Casey's campaign aide, Max Hugel, was later rewarded for his efforts by being appointed to head covert actions at CIA, but he was fired over charges of improper stock trading purchases. During those few short months, March to October in 1980, a domestic destabilization of America by Americans was shaking the country unknown to its citizens. To recapitulate, Casey used the term intelligence operation to describe the monitoring when he and Reagan's campaign chief of staff, Edwin Meese, met with reporters at a breakfast during the Republican National Convention in Detroit in July of 1980. A Republican official said use of this term alarmed Meese and others in the campaign and was not repeated. Robert Garrick, who was in charge of plans and policy for Reagan's campaign, said the campaign intelligence group's information came chiefly from a network of retired military officers who monitored the movements of U.S. troops and transport planes at various air bases across the country. A former high-level campaign advisor to Reagan said that one of the campaign chiefs, Richard V. Allen, received copies of portions of daily staff reports that had been sent to Carter's advisor on national security affairs, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Brzezinski told the Post that the reports to him from NSC staff members on each day's activities were, quote, sometimes extraordinary sensitive material of the highest nature. Any, any unauthorized distribution to anyone outside the White House would be very serious. Continuing, skipping down farther. On Sunday, April 20th, 1980, the Washington Star played a long, vivid story, quote, the hostages can be freed by one Miles Copeland. The Carter White House and National Security Council were aghast. They knew who Miles Copeland was. Miles Copeland was so high in the secret world of the Central Intelligence Agency that he had been the American liaison to Colonel Nasser in Egypt during the most sensitive period of Middle Eastern maneuvering in the 1950s. Copeland, in his book Game of Nations, discussed in detail the zero-sum techniques used by CIA to destabilize governments 
as in Iran, where Copeland had been a master player in the 1953 coup, which restored power to the Shah. Copeland then had intimate knowledge of Egypt, Iran, and Oman, and the oil sheikdoms, where his own private intelligence PR firm operated for giant oil consortiums. This is important because Egyptian, Iranian, and protectorate sources figured vitally in the secret hostage negotiations and rescue plans. These same sources had been Copeland's for many years. Oman was a primary channel in the flow of information about the rescue. Carter, in his memoirs, stresses again and again the almost incredible lengths to which the President's White House and National Security Council were going to keep the raid secret. But Reagan had a, quote, mole, and it is becoming credible to believe a back channel. Miles Copeland and his various firms in fronts of old boys, referred to in his own Star article. The Carter White House was also concentrating on Oman. Quote, My persistent anxiety was to maintain secrecy. However, I was soon forced to share the news with one, uh, one, uh, with one other head of state. When I received information about disturbing stories originating with a former British officer in Oman who was employed by the Sultan. He had reported to British officials in London that we had planes in Oman, which was true, and that they were loaded with ammunition and supplies for the Afghan freedom fighters. The British and Omanis were getting nervous, and I had to send Warren Christopher to London to brief Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and Foreign Minister Peter Carrington about the true purpose of the planes. Christopher was careful not to ask them for any comment, but simply informed them about our plans for the rescue." Unquote. Copeland had worked with British intelligence since World War II, and his MI6 assets in Oman are the best there are, according to his colleagues. The ship movements for the rescue were in the Gulf of Oman. The transport planes supporting the ship in the Gulf of Oman were flying out of Egypt. There was nothing for Casey's retired watchers to watch in the United States. Casey's eyes and Copeland's were watching from the Middle East, the source of the back channel. Finally, Copeland is an almost legendary figure in Iran. He refers to every level and area of the country continually, and it is clear that his contacts in the Savak, that's of course the Shah's secret police, are still alive. Cop Copeland had helped to set up the notorious murderous police of the Shah in the first place. According to authoritative accounts, although the Joint Chiefs of Staff had told Carter categorically after the hostages were taken that no rescue, def rescue effort was feasible, the military had done a complete turnaround in the intervening months. They knew exactly where the hostages were, a fact they hadn't been certain of at the outset. They had evolved a plan of operation in which they believed, and they had a force in training to execute it. Copeland starts out his astounding speculative fiction, unquote, by saying, Early last December, a young chap from a certain government agency made the rounds of us old-timers, unquote, unofficially and off the record, unquote, to ask whether we thought an Entebbe-type or SWAT-type raid on the U.S. Embassy in Tehran was feasible. His intention was to elicit a resounding no so as to justify President Carter's policy of restraint when pressure was building up to get the hostages home by Christmas. <clears throat> Copeland, codenamed Mr. Lincoln, now disclosed that he and Safford, the Weasel, Masterson, and the Whistler were all somehow involved in the military planning for some kind of surprise rescue. The Weasel et al., Copeland, uh, Copeland assures us, are the kings of covert action from OSS days with William Casey, unquote. Shortly after being approached by the government, Copeland states that he and the other old boys did, in reality, work out a rescue scenario. If one compares the Copeland plan, unquote, with what in fact we know the Carter plan contemplated, the most serious questions arise. Hamilton Jordan quotes his boss, Jimmy Carter, at a National Security Council luncheon meeting on April 11, 1980. As you know, Carter continued, the first week the hostages were seized, I ordered the Joint Chiefs to develop a rescue plan that could be used in dire circumstances. A team of expert paramilitary people now report that they have confidence in their ability to rescue our people. Before I make up my mind, I want to know your reactions, unquote. The President might say or even believe he hadn't made up his mind, but I knew he had. Harold, he said, I'd like for you and Dave Jones to outline the plan, the risks, the problems and the prospects for success." Unquote. So secret was the meeting that Secretary of State Cyrus Vance only learned of the decision to proceed with the rescue after April 11th because he had not been in Washington for the meeting. On April 20th, 
Vance read the Copeland story in the Star and, perhaps because of it, demanded to know how much was true. Carter tells Vance the plan. Vance is very upset because it's too late. The go order had been given on the 18th. On April 21st, Vance submits his letter of resignation to Carter. Vance had not known, but the NSC had. We now know that the Reagan-Casey spy operation had sources or moles in that NSC. Besides moles, there is strong indication that Casey, Copeland, and the old boys had deep back channels all along from MI6 and old CIA assets. Interrupting MI6 is uh, British intelligence. Continuing. Copeland knows that he is in a minefield with his speculations and attempts to cover himself. Quote, Before proceeding, it must be stated that President Carter has not confided his intentions to me, nor has this article been cleared by the CIA or anyone else. It has, however, been agreed to by my old colleagues who wish to be associated with it, unquote. Copeland then proceeds to discuss how he and other CIA agents, quote, turned the crowd when the agency orchestrated the overthrow of the democratically elected government of Mossadegh in 1953. We know now from the Carter memoirs and other sources that that is precisely what the U.S. plan to rescue the hostages envisaged and that CIA street agents were in place and ready to go into action when the violence around the embassy should reach the stage of mass confusion. If we compare what President Carter and his aides have written and said about the rescue plan, one conclusion is inescapable. Now they're comparing. Carter, we had blueprints of our embassy buildings in Tehran, of course. Much more important, we received information from someone who cannot be identified, who was thoroughly familiar with the compound, knew where every American hostage was located, how many and what kind of guards were there at different times during the night, and the daily schedule of the hostages and their captors. This was the first time we knew the precise location of the Americans. Then comparing that to what Copeland said, Copeland, already we have detailed maps of the embassy compound. We will need to know more, however, about where and how the prisoners are kept, where the booby traps, if any, are planted, how the patrols work, what arms and munitions there are, how food and medical supplies are delivered. Carter. Our agents, who moved freely in and out of Tehran under the guise of business or media missions, had studied the degree of vigilance of the captors. And uh, they're quoting Newsweek from May 12th. For weeks beforehand, American intelligence agents, some posing as European businessmen, had infiltrated Iran to ease the way for the commando raid. Some agents, presumably in Tehran much longer, may have penetrated the ranks of the militants guarding the hostages at the U.S. Embassy. Newsweek, for May 12th. A senior U.S. official told Newsweek that excellent intelligence had been turned up on the Tehran Embassy, quote, virtually from the inside. Writing in the London Daily Telegraph, respected defense correspondent Claire Hollingworth claimed that more than 100 American agents still were operating in Iran last week. Quote, Iranian members of the teams, Hollingworth wrote, managed to bend several of the captors, who then became moles inside the embassy. These moles were ready and willing to assist in the, in the escape, unquote. <coughs> Excuse me. Compare that to Copeland. Copeland, considering what we might offer and considering that there are sometimes as many of, as 40 of them, meaning students, away from the compound, out on the town, or spending the night at their homes, this is an easier feat than it might appear, meaning the recruitment. Considering the number of prospective agents, and to the CIA pro, every one of those students is a potential agent until proven otherwise, the law of averages is on our side. Continuing. Carter. The trucks our agents had purchased would be removed from a warehouse on the outskirts of Tehran, driven to a point near the mountain hiding place, and used to carry the rescue <coughs> excuse me, and used to carry the rescue team to the city. At a prearranged time, the rescue team would simultaneously enter the foreign ministry building and the compound, overpower the guards, and free the American hostages. The helicopters would land at the sites, picking up our people and carrying them to an abandoned airstrip near the city. Communication between the Pentagon and the rescue team using satellites and other rally facilities would be, uh, I think they mean relay facilities, would be instantaneous. I would receive telephone reports from David Jones and Harold Brown from the Pentagon. Copeland. This, this is the Carter at, uh, account, now the Copeland uh, forecast, really, of the rescue mission. There will be a staging area somewhere within helicopter range of Tehran at which brush-up training will be given the two teams. There will also be a point known as the penultimate position from which the attack actually will be launched. The choice of this latter is highly important. It, 
or they must be near enough to the target to allow for a thrust lasting less than one minute, and at the same time, it must be part of the peoplescape in the immediate area, peoplescape in quotes. This staging area may or may not be the same as the field headquarters, where some communication assistant will monitor the operation to keep Washington informed. Now, uh, in, in a section called Safe Haven and Evacuation Carter, from there, the abandoned airstrip near Tehran, two, C-40, two C-141s would fly all the Americans to safety across the desert area of Saudi Arabia. We also planned the procedure after the mission was completed for notifying Oman, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt whose territories would be used or crossed during the mission. Now compare this with the Copeland account. There are several well-stocked areas near Tehran to which our helicopters may flee in a very short time with minimum danger of being followed. This use of foreign airspace or landing areas, of course, is a matter for our State Department. For present purposes, it need only be said that our government has more friends in the Middle East than is commonly suspected. Continuing... Quoting from Newsweek, there was speculation that the Americans intended to use non-lethal gas to neutralize the embassy guards. Quoting Copeland, this step, which, con which security considerations prevent me from describing in any detail, consists of measures to inca incapacitate all resistance. It includes such men measures as the use of stunning or nauseating but otherwise harmless gases. Now, Carter... On April 18th, the president writes, I had quite a discussion with my closest advisors about how to deal with the congressional leadership on the Iran decision. Fritz Mondale led the argument for minimum advance notice and maximum secrecy. Cy Vance took the opposite tack, maintaining that we should advise the Democratic and Republican leaders in the House and Senate. I agreed with Fritz. Now, comparing with Copeland... Unfortunately, Copeland writes, this whole plan, whether executed separately or as part of an overall military assault, has a weakness. It is that our government can take no action which does not have the full support of the people and of Congress. There is a sad quote in Jimmy Carter's journal for April 21st. Quote, we listened carefully to all news reports but heard only one other indication of a leak. In monitoring radio broadcasts all over Iran, we heard a story from up near the Iraqi border of an attempted rescue mission. It turned out to be a repeat of a conjectural story which had run earlier in the Washington Star. No damage was done, unquote. But the damage was done. Copeland dwells on CIA assets in Iraq. In his article, the Iranians have made clear that they had advance warning. That only the mechanical problems in the desert that aborted the full raid prevented the police and military from slaughtering the American hostages, agents, diplomats, all. By Sunday, April 20th, according to Carter, Radio Iran was broadcasting Copeland's story. The, quote, surprise was spoiled. Iranian double agents had remained loyal to the Ayatollah, as had Western-trained military men. Repeat, according to the highest Iranian sources, the rescue of the hostages had been blown. Were the Iranians bluffing when they insisted that the raid never could have succeeded? Was doomed in advance? There is a final strange piece in the puzzle. During the hostage crisis in 1980, U.S. Army intelligence set up a special unit in Iran. Intelligence Support Activity, ISA, was so secret that it operated virtually under an illegal status. It has since been disbanded. However, in 1980, CIA Director Stansfield Turner did not know of the existence of ISA, but Reagan campaign director William Casey did. According to a former Carter associate, the ISA, quote, smells like a back channel of Casey's. The coincidence between Copeland's version and official plans revealed by Carter, Jordan, Powell, and others is too great to let pass. Copeland and the official sources agree. Disguise will be used. False communications will be employed to confuse the authorities. Agents pretending to be media people would infiltrate the compound during the excitement. Further, Copeland chatters along about cover stories when, in fact, it is Copeland's star piece that is ripping to shreds what Hamilton Jordan describes as a disinformation campaign that will relax the Iranians, unquote. There was more than mechanical problems at Desert... There was more than mechanical problems at Desert One where the mission began. The commander of the operation, Charles Beckwith, let it be known that there was a sudden and suspicious raid of traffic that night in the desert. In Washington, planners feared that the raid's cover had been blown. Had it... According to Time magazine, quote, One of the many ironies of the entire mission was the fact that the C-130s were heading for a remote spot in the desert 
that the Iranians had feared might someday be used by U.S. forces. Indeed, they even had a map of the spot. It was discovered in the papers of Mahmoud Jafari in J-A-F-A-R-I-A-N, a pro-Shah counterinsurgency strategist who was executed after the revolution. Jafarian told his captors that the staging site had been secretly built by the CIA with the Shah's knowledge for possible emergency use. Carter's plan to rescue the hostages had even more odds against it. William Casey's law firm, Rogers and Wells, represented the Pahlavi Foundation, a huge conduit for the Shah and his family specializing in narcotics and overseas covert acts. The foundation was riddled with agents who had served with Casey and Copeland in the OSS and after throughout the Cold War. Mary McGrory, the Pulitzer Prize-winning columnist, speculated in the Washington Post, quote, What would the old soldiers have done? Would they have told the public that Carter was planning a coup to rescue the hostages at the risk of endangering the lives of those involved? Continuing, Somehow, the Iranians did know. Rescue team leader Charles Beckwith himself told Newsweek that a number of CIA agents in Tehran had pulled out, so that if the rescue had gone forward, the Americans would have been compromised and at total risk. We know now from the New York Times book on the aborted mission that within a week of the embassy takeover, Brzezinski, in quotes, Brzezinski convened in his office the first in a series of high-level secret meetings of what came to be known as the Military Committee. The Military Committee, which met two or three times a week, also laid the plans for the rescue effort that was finally launched the following April. Unquote. Among those the group consulted was H. Ross Perot, the flamboyant Dallas millionaire who, ten months earlier, had employed former Green Beret officers in a successful raid that freed two of his Electronic Data Systems Corporation employees from a Tehran jail. Perot had worked closely with Casey and many of his, quote, old boy aides over the years, so here is still another potential back channel to the Reagan operation. Is it coincidence that on April 9, 1980, the students holding the embassy vowed to, quote, destroy the hostages immediately if the U.S. began, quote, even the smallest military act against Iran, unquote. The New York Times, too, quoting informed sources, reported on the rescue plan with words that had been anticipated in Copeland's article. The Times maps also amplified Copeland's predictions. On the rescue team, the New York Times write, writes, Rescue teams moved to warehouse on outskirts of Tehran for last-minute briefing by American infiltrators. Copeland writes, It is essential, however, that for both internal and external reasons, the rescue team must have a definite mercenary character and be a discreet combination of Kashais, Kurds, and, of course, Farsis. The New York Times wrote, Troops break into the embassy, cut telephone and electricity lines, one group neutralizes Iranians, another frees hostages and evacuates them by helicopters from embassy grounds or nearby Anjadki Soccer Stadium. Copeland wrote, Once the embassy has been entered and the defense is neutralized, Team A will have on its hands a lot of confused defenders and very sleepy hostages. By then, our three helicopters will land at designated points and the attackers will begin leading the hostages. Meanwhile, Team B will have taken control of all communications into and out of the compound. And skipping down to the end of the article. What did Reagan know about the rescue mission? And when did he know it? How much more does Charles Beckwith know? Reagan rewarded Beckwith for his, quote, failure by giving him the top job of the 1984 Olympic security and anti-terrorism responsibility. Copeland's article appeared in the U.S. 96 hours before the rescue began, and in Iran, it was broadcast repeatedly up until the day itself. Why are those who blame researchers and the Freedom of Information Act for, quote, emasculating covert action silent on this shocking leak? Is the Copeland piece the crown jewel of the Casey, quote, intelligence operation to monitor an October surprise, in Casey's own words? This question is as terrible as those asked of Nixon and Kissinger about the manipulation of the Paris peace talks for political gain. A terrible question of treason. By the way, those uh, peace talks we're going to be uh, touching on in a later article that we're going to deal with this evening. Obviously, I think the, the point is spelled out pretty clearly by Don Fried in that article. Uh, the, it, it, that it should be noted, too, that article was in 1983. The existence of this back-channel intelligence operation has been very effectively established, and we'll talk about it some more later in the broadcast, in fact, at considerable length. The point being here that, as we said at the beginning, 
It appears that the Reagan administration, even before it was officially in power, had been mended. This obviously is a tradition that the U.S. national security establishment had been following for some time. That's why we began focusing on the Turple Wilson team, but has been strategically manipulating terrorist incidents in such a way as to not only affect U.S. policy, but indeed to basically spit in the face of the founding fathers and those who drew up the U.S. Consti- Constitution and our system of government. The uh, This particular uh, manipulation of terrorism is, is particularly cynical in light of most of the fact that most of these people were military men and that basically they, their actions got several U.S. military people killed. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, terrorist incidents and the, this group's contacts with many of the top terror groups in existence today in the next program. But again, it appears very, very likely that through an- the manipulation of a number of different aspects of the hostage crisis, including quite possibly the initiation of that crisis in the first place with Henry Kissinger uh, tied in with Task Force 157 and his pressure on Jimmy Carter, and then with the subsequent deep sixing of the desert uh, rescue mission, that basically they were not only committing treason, but uh, killing a number of their own people as well. And again, the the key here is not that the people who took the hostages were all working for the United States government or willing employees, but that the situation could be manipulated strategically in such a way as to produce the desired effect. And that's really the key here. Now, a, an interesting connection, and by the way, research credit for this goes to one of our listeners, a very astute listener who uh, made who gleaned this for us and sent it on in, and uh, we're very thankful to him. He's done a lot of other good work for us in the past. This is from the book, The Richest Man in the World, The Story of Adnan Khashoggi, by Ronald Kessler, K-E-S-S-L-E-R, published in hardcover by Warner Books, copyright 1986. Of course, Adnan Khashoggi is the Saudi Arabian billionaire and weapons dealer who is one of the central figures in the whole Iran arms sale. In an interesting section of the book called The Yachts, it mentions that Adnan Khashoggi is quite close to Miles Copeland, whom Don Freed credits with uh, being a the probable source of of the deep sixing, or at least one of the sources of the deep sixing of the rescue attempt. Of parties on the Nabila, Khashoggi's yacht, Kessler writes, most often it is on the Nabila that Khashoggi throws his birthday parties. For his 48th, he picked up 200 guests at Monte Carlo, then cruised for two hours while his guests ate beluga caviar and sipped Dom Perignon. At 9 p.m., the boat picked up 200 more guests at Cannes, including Brooke Shields, David Niven, David Niven Jr., and Stuart Copeland, the drummer from the police rock band. His father, former CIA operative Miles Copeland, travels with Khashoggi to weight loss spas in Germany. And again, we don't want to damn people by association, but the connection between Miles Copeland, uh, an apparent early player in the secret team's manipulations of terror for political purposes, is quite close to Adnan Khashoggi, one of the central weapons dealers in the by now much publicized Iranian arms sales. Okay, we're going to continue and look at a few other interesting connections between the secret team and uh, the uh, failed hostage rescue mission, uh, some more direct physical connections besides the back channel that we've been talking about. This is an article that originally appeared in the San Jose Mercury News for Friday, December 12, 1986. It's uh, by Frank Grieve and Stephen Stecklow of the Mercury News Washington Bureau. The headline, Failed 1980 Rescue, Contraflights Linked. This is Dateline, Washington. Three retired U.S. Air Force officers who oversaw rebel arms supply efforts in Nicaragua also helped plan Desert One, the disastrous 1980 hostage rescue mission in Iran, according to senior officers and Contra Airlift documents. The officers are Air Force Major General Richard V. Secord, Lieutenant Colonel Richard B. Gadd, G-A-D-D, and Colonel Robert C. Dutton. Secord and Dutton, invoking their constitutional protection against self-incrimination, have refused to answer questions in recent appearances before congressional committees investigating the administration's secret Iranian and Contra arms supply missions. Gad has been identified in news accounts as an airdrop organizer. A fourth covert operations specialist, retired Army Special Forces Master Sergeant John C. Cup, now in business with Gad, recruited at least three other veterans of the Desert One mission for the Contra resupply effort. All were alumni of Delta Force, an elite counter-terrorist commando unit formed in 1979, sources said. Accounts thus far have identified the Central American mercenaries primarily as retired employees of Air America, 
a former CIA proprietary. But little has been known about their shared involvement in carrying out some of this country's most secret and sensitive missions. In active duty, they carried out official covert missions. In retirement, they were free to carry out a mission the White House actively supported, but could not order because of legal restrictions. The Defense Department has denied any involvement in the Contra arms supply effort and said its role in the Iran arms sale was limited. Failures in both the Iranian and Contra operations also cast doubt on the competence of the mercenary force. In particular, an August 1980 Pentagon review of the Desert One rescue attempt faulted its leaders for failing to destroy secret, incriminating documents contained in helicopters they abandoned in the desert. The failures to destroy embarrassing evidence, quote, reflect unfavorably on the performance of the personnel involved, unquote, generals reviewing the Iran performance said. Six years later, it happened again. Documents found in the C-123 cargo plane shot down October 5th over Nicaragua led reporters quickly to White House officials and others associated with the secret airdrops. Three leaders of that operation, Secord, Gad, and Dutton, also planned much of the Air Force's role in the April 1980 Desert One disaster in Iran, according to retired Army Lieutenant General Samuel V. Wilson. He was vice chairman of the Pentagon Military Review Panel that investigated the incident in which eight U.S. military men died. Well, fascinating, isn't it, to think about the back channel to the White House. Uh, later became the official Ronald Reagan uh, presidency secret team, even though, as we've said, many of these people have been the secret team for a long time. But Secord et al. Um, also happened to be on the front end of the failed Desert One mission.